Hello, friends. Welcome back to the Strong Stoic Podcast. I am your host, Brandon Tumlin. Consider checking out my Telegram group chat if you want to join in on the discussion of the Strong Stoic Podcast episodes. You can also support me on Patreon and all of my social medias. My articles you can find on Medium and the Stoic Gym. And many of you know also Dr. Kai Whiting, author of Being Better Stoicism for a World Worth Living In. Kai's been on the podcast, I think, three times. Uh, And Kai offers one-on-one university-level stoic mentoring at a fraction of the price of taking a university course. He is a lecturer in stoicism. And personally, I learned a lot from Kai and would highly recommend him as a mentor. And he is taking on new mentees at the moment. So if you're interested, please email myself directly and I will set you up. That's at thestrongstoic at gmail.com the strong stoic at gmail.com or you can reach out to me on instagram or anywhere else but email would be the best with the title the subject of the title uh stoic uh or kai whiting stoic mentoring something like that and i'll get you set up with that let me introduce my guest today i have the privilege of speaking with will johncock will studies how an individual's thoughts and actions as well as an individual's attributes, are the effects of social and physical environments. He works within the fields of continental philosophy, ancient and modern Stoic philosophy, social theory, and sociology. He is also an author, and his newest book, Beyond the Individual, Stoic Philosophy on Community and Connection, is coming out early next year. In this episode, Will and I talk about the line between individual identity and group identity, being yourself, and whether or not It's a good thing to actually be yourself, the stoic view from above, and much, much more. I learned a lot from this conversation, and I hope you do as well. So without further ado, please welcome Will Johncock. You get get five minutes into the conversation, and it's like, damn it, I haven't even hit record. I know, Um, I do it at work too. You record stuff for work? I guess so your meetings and stuff to go back on? Yes, particularly for training. Oh, okay, gotcha. And sometimes I do the training session or someone does the training session just in terms of how to use systems or whatever. And yeah, you get halfway through and yeah. realize that you haven't actually hit the record button. Yeah, that's rough. That's rough. <laughs> Anyways, you come highly recommended. So I'm, I'm really excited <laughs> to talk to you and I enjoyed our last, let's call it a mini chat. Yeah, so, it was fun. Um, yeah, it was fun for sure. I always, uh, you know, you're, you're, int- you're really knowledgeable about an area that I'm not very knowledgeable at it all, uh, at least in, in the depths of it, which is sociology. So mm. I'm excited to extract some wisdom for you. And I guess I'll just kick it off by saying that Stoicism is kind of an interesting philosophy in that it says we have full control over our perception of reality, uh, at, at least up to a certain extent, obviously, because there, there is an objective reality, which they acknowledge, but, but that we have individual sovereignty. And a lot of people look at that as being Stoicism, but there's also a foundation, a spirit that runs through it as well, which is this pro-social element, this element, this requirement to be engaged into society and in, in a short phrase to make the world a better place. So I know you've studied this quite a bit. And so I'm really interested to know kind of how we understand that boundary, because it is it is complicated, right? Because you can imagine a practicing stoic is really only going to focus on the individual sovereignty. But that doesn't mean that you're not aligned with the more underlying spirit of Stoicism, which is engaging pro-socially. So I guess, like, what got you interested in in that, in chasing and trying to define what that boundary was or is? Yeah, in sociology, it's often phrased in terms of the question of where do you begin individually versus where does, let's say, the social influence end or vice versa? And so that kind of question was what interested me in sociology, but also in areas of philosophy, which led me to Stoicism. And so those areas of philosophy were a few French 20th century uh, thinkers. I don't need to go into too much detail there, but some names are Michel Foucault and Gilles Deleuze and Julia Kristeva, and they all sparked my interest actually in stoicism whilst i was interested in questions around social structure and once i became aware of stoicism more comprehensively because when i was an undergrad i'd studied philosophy and classical philosophy and the stoics were always just a bit of a a side mention let's say 
to Plato and Aristotle and, and their other contemporaries. But when I really explored Stoicism, I found that whilst it did have a, a great emphasis on the individual in terms of what can you think that you control about yourself and what can you think that you don't control about yourself? And we can talk about that. But it also had this real sensitivity to our embedded nature within a physical world and a social structure. And once I identified that, I became really enamored with the philosophy. And I became enamored with it because I saw that there was more to it than just a matter of practicing certain techniques to become a more self confident, a more self-assured a more self-reliant person and so that was the germination let's say of my interest in stoicism and very consistent therefore with sociology because sociology is looking at ways in which we can view ourselves as individuals within a context and well within an environment and i do believe and my reading of stoicism will argue that that is one of the classical or one of the orthodox positions within its philosophy too. Yeah, for sure. I, I would say it was a brief little thing I want to highlight there because you mentioned kind of like the, <clears throat> the depth of this philosophy that often gets overlooked when you're looking at it. Say you're looking at talking about Aristotle and Plato and then the Stoics, which are kind of grouped in, you know, the Stoics. It's like this group as opposed to mm, individuals. Yeah, Obviously, once you get into Stoicism, you, you know the different Stoics, but, but they are kind of grouped together, whereas you have Plato, Aristotle, the Stoics. But um, I, I remember that very, very vividly for me because I, I realized at one point just how deep it was. And I, I didn't, Stoicism is so cool because you can kind of learn the gist of it really quickly and you can implement it really quickly but then to really understand it on a deep deep level i think that takes like a lifetime like did you have a similar experience with that in terms of kind of a i guess awakening to the depth of it yeah i did i i when i first became aware of it it was really in the this is about 10 12 years ago it was in the midst of its uh resurgence of public interest in it and and so it was felt like it was really buzzing around. And initially, even though I came to it through these other philosophers, I thought that perhaps it was just, at least the surviving fragments were just going to tell us uh, these great techniques about psychological well-being, let's say. But yeah, soon I discovered there was so much more to it, and that's really when I got into it. and. I think in that regard, I was aware of this and I'm always interested in theories which have these little tensions within them and, and stoicism does have it regarding the social commentaries because all the commentaries around our sociality, because in one regard, you get people like Seneca who are very vocal about us not being too influenced by our social surroundings. And this is uh, echoed through the other Stoics as well. And they will all do it in different ways. So you're right, we can't just say there's one Stoic position here, but they will all in some regard, Epictetus, for instance, will express this concern. And, and there is consistently this warning about being too dominated by what the masses believe. Don't get too caught up in, don't be too influenced by, don't be too shaped by external surroundings. But yet there's the tension that I mentioned is also apparent when in the next paragraph, they'll tell us that we're inherently social. And as I think much of my writing is discussing, for the Stoics, our first obligations are to each other and to fulfill our social or communal roles. And I like you using Stoicism as a way to consider beyond the philosophy itself, what it means to be a self and what it means to be an individual versus what it means to be, as the Stoics would say, inherently obligated to each other and to uh, a group, indeed, the largest group they conceive of being the entirety of humanity um, in the version of Stoicism that is called cosmopolitanism. And that is an indication of what you're talking about, where Stoicism becomes much more uh, complex than just a matter of individual prosperity. 
Right, right, right. Well, and that's interesting too, because it's almost like they thought that you becoming who you really are, that's really what stoicism is. Of course, they believe that to be the virtuous good person that we all fundamentally want to flourish. And by becoming you, by living according to nature, which includes that at all levels of analysis, including, you know, objective reality and then human nature and community and then your individual personality. But then if you do that, in other words, if you become more yourself over time, at the same time, you're also servicing the world so that there, there's alignment here. And it's very, like, I like to think of it like harmony. It's like when you play a guitar, you have all these notes that kind of come mm-hmm. together and it just, it vibrates yeah. and it's beautiful. And that's kind of, that's really how I think that's what they meant by that. So it's interesting that sometimes we think about these things as separate, like there's the individual and then there's the group. But I think there can actually be alignment between them, which allows all of us to flourish. Yes, yes. And I, and I like this because so much of, I like your reading, because so much of Stoicism is categorized as self-help. And it's important that it is because it is wonderful to see a philosophy being used practically and to uh, have this real world kind of efficacy in terms of how we can apply principles rather than just read about them in a book and relay them to someone else. I think that what you said at the start of your, of your, of your message there, though, was that whilst we can talk about the self and the prosperity for the self and learn these techniques through stoicism, there's also a way in which we must recognize that the self is implicated in something beyond the self. And one of the, again, I'm going to keep using this word, but one of the most orthodox Stoic principles is to see oneself as a fragment of something bigger. You know, they, reg- and I say they, and I don't mean to imply that every single ancient Stoic thinker was, was mentioning this, but to a degree, all of the surviving fragments indicate that the Stoics we're aware of shared this view, and that is that we are a, a fragment of something larger. We are a, a piece of a whole. And that's where you get that sense of the self as being very much uh, jigsaw-like, bound into a bigger picture. And that, in my view, and I, I dare say in your view too, is it, it relates to the systems analysis and the systems perspective that the Stoics have of each of us which will then cast a new light on the whole idea of self-help applications of of stoicism if the self indeed is not this isolated entity. Right, right, right. Yes. I love the analogy of a of a jigsaw. Hmm. That's uh that's interesting. That term though self-help. If you think about that, that can mean a lot of different things. That can mean selfishly helping yourself, which of course <laughs> is very unstoic. But I, I try and think about like how we relate these words to something like stoicism because it is a buzzword. People hear self help. We have self. It's like a category now of of books, right? Self help books. Mm-hmm. But I think if if again, I think if if it is aligned properly, I think an act that does help yourself does help the world. And then you might ask, like, well, you know, if if you're going to help yourself. And it's going to be selfish. Are you really going to be happy about that? And that, that's where kind of sociology comes in. You know what I mean? Like if you do something selfishly, you might say gain money or something if you rip people off. But then it's like, can you really flourish? Can you really be happy? Can you live a happy life if you're doing that kind of screwing the rest of the people around you, so to speak? Hmm. Yeah, I, I suppose for the Stoics, they would say that when we are thinking we are thinking individually in terms of we're thinking it's not it's not anti-stoic to think of individual prosperity and right epictetus is adamant about that as is marcus aurelius and so we don't want to lose sight of their the priority they do give to this idea of the individual in in terms of you need to be thinking of your own welfare the irony of that, though, is that when you're thinking individually and when you're thinking of your own welfare, they will argue that you're thinking of the collective welfare as well. Right. If, if and the, 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 the key point here is that if whenever you do anything, 
you are aware that you are an individual piece of a whole or a universal system. And that's the view from above. And it's not meant to be just a matter of the view from above serving my own humility and my own prosperity, but it's meant to be a default mechanism by which we know with everything we think and everything we do that we are serving something that is in, in essence our origin, which is the system itself. And as long as we're doing that, which seemingly also is the definition of thinking rationally, is to be consciously right. and constantly aware of how embedded we are with everything else. As long as we're doing that, then we are going to experience this prosperity and we're going to experience individual prosperity. And that prosperity will be linked to, you know, a whole range of other aspects of stoicism. They talk about happiness, eudaimonic happiness, all these kinds of things, which we can talk about. But to relate it then to sociology, um, my favorite areas of sociology are, are concerned with a set of theories that are categorized as structuralism. And structuralism will argue that everything you think, and this is going to be incredibly critiqued in the latter part of the 20th century and the, and the early part of this century. Uh, the structuralism will argue that everything you think is to some way always an expression of something else. And therefore, for the, if the Stoics, if we were to read this through the Stoics, we would say that happiness is to accept this reality about your mind. And in the first chapter of a book I've recently written, I argue that Epictetus is so adamant about our mind being a fragment of something else. He talks about the daemons, and Posidonius talks about this too, about our mind being uh, this fragment, which is in connection with the greater whole, and it's in connection with the greater whole through these things called daemons, which will collect, connect our individual mind with the global or the universal mind. And prosperity is thinking in a way which is aware of this, and we can be selfish accordingly. We can think of ourselves but we can think of ourselves and we can want to have individual prosperity whilst being conscious that our individual prosperity and our individual mind is an expression of the system of which we are a part. So you, you raise an important point there in that we can't just exclude the idea of individuality, right? but we have to understand individuality either in sociology, according to my view, or in Stoic philosophy through this larger uh, system. Let me ask you this, because that, that, that was great, by the way. I, great, great words. Um, I'm interested, though, we talk about this view from above and, mm. and being a piece, understanding that you are a piece of the collective. And I, I guess my question is, do you, think, do you think it's necessary to recognize that if you are acting in a way that is recognizing that. So do you need to be conscious of it? And, and maybe here, here's an example. So <laughs> got some chain, chainsaw action going yeah, on. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. So, but, but, okay, so here's an example. If you invite people over to cook with you and you bring someone in that's not, let's say, great at cooking, but you're kind of the master chef and you're going to direct, you say, here, cut up this onion. They can focus on cutting up that onion. But they might not have no they might not have any idea of what it's used for. Now the question is, do they need to have that connection for them individually to flourish? Does everyone, or is that an individual thing? Because I see some people that seem to they seem to be flourishing, but they're not really I, I can't they don't seem to be making that connection to the bigger whole, even though they're acting in a way that is. Does that does that make sense? Um so you're talking about people who are undertake an individual act and they're not aware of or they don't exhibit an awareness seemingly of their connection with something beyond the individual or the localized environment right yeah so they're 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 acting in a way that let's say is pro-social and for individual pros prosperity but that they're not necessarily making that connection but they're acting in a way like is it is it living the life itself that allows you to flourish or is that perception of it an important element well, it's interesting, isn't it? The distinction between behavior and thought. And right. if I'm out there in the field, if I'm doing social work, for instance, if I'm helping the less fortunate in terms of uh, feeding them or clothing them or housing them, am I? but if I'm doing so and I'm not thinking at the same time, 
I am a piece of a larger whole. I am uh, an incidental fragment in the entire scope of time, and I and I need to recognize my position in the play, in the system accordingly. If I'm not conscious of that, but I am therefore contributing in a in a way that's beyond my own prosperity, would we consider that according to the Stoics to be rational? Would we consider that according to the Stoics to therefore be a way of being from which I would derive eudaimonic happiness. And I believe that there is an element of behavior which is always bound up in thought. And even if we're not constantly thinking with every, let's say I'm working in a soup kitchen and with every mouth that I feed, if I'm not pouring the soup into the bowl, literally thinking, I'm a fragment of a whole. I'm a fragment of a whole. I'm a fragment of a whole. Um, But nevertheless, the at some point the idea has impelled me towards acting this way that I have a service or a duty or an obligation to something that's greater than myself. Then that is still the 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 act itself is still a legacy of a thought. It's still a legacy of a conscious state, and in this regard, one of the most important resources doesn't come from a stoic at all but it comes from cicero's on duties where he and indeed it's one of my favorite stoic texts given even though it's not from a from a stoic himself and in it he 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 goes into great detail about what the stoics think about duty and obligation and responsibility to others and that's where i get one of the the most important sources i think about stoicism's social and communal priorities and there isn't the argument there that we need to be thinking about it every day and or in every moment and it isn't even cicero's argument is much less cosmological it's not necessarily about how we and the planets and everything align but it's much more political and it's much more about how for the stoics it's a practical philosophy it's an action-based philosophy it's not bound up in the page. It's bound up in how you behave and how you, the instruction or the example you set to your fellow citizens. Right, right. Yeah, for sure. And, and I, I would actually agree with you. I think that that perception, I think that awareness is important. I don't, but I, I would agree that I don't think it's important. You don't have to be fully conscious of it, thinking about it at every step in the way. But it's almost like if you, yeah. if you cut up the onion for the meal, and then you find out that they threw it out. Like, you'd probably be a little upset about that, right? Like, because you thought you were contributing to a, a beautiful meal. It's like, oh, this meal is so good. And then you find out that they threw it out. You might be a little upset about that, right? <laughs> um, but at the same time, though, I'm, I'm curious how a lot of people, where a lot of people struggle with finding meaning in their day jobs or well, their mm-hmm. jobs in, in their day-to-day life. And this has always struck me as really interesting because I see people that work jobs that many might not deem fulfilling. Like I see people working at the drive-through, for example, at Tim Hortons up here in Canada. And, Mm -hmm. and there's people there that work and they really like their job and they're really friendly and they, they they just kind of make your morning when they give you your cup of coffee. And I'm just wondering for people, because you can do that same job. You see people doing that and they're miserable. And I'm just wondering if there is this awareness for the people that seem to be doing it happily that if i give this person a smile they're going to go to their day job and they're going to be happier doing their job and they're going to be more fulfilled in their life and that is going to contribute in that work environment now if i do that for every person that comes to this drive-through that ripple effect is going to be literally all over the community or the city and so they seem they seem to be making that connection even if it's subconscious i think but but then again the question is that is that an individual thing or or is that, you know, being aligned with sort of the pro-social element? But I do think it's the case that if you're working, if you feel like your job is meaningless, maybe take a zoom out a little bit and just just see if you do your job well, see what what's going to happen, what could happen potentially. Yeah, there is so much in this. First of all, if you find your life or your job to be menial and you're looking to take something from stoicism, to alleviate that, one of the key Stoic points would be, as I will uh, bore people about 
the interconnection of everything, the physical interconnection of everything. And it depends how people want to approach stoicism. Do they want to pick and choose certain tenets, certain positions of it to help their psychological well-being in, in some ways? Or do they really want to adopt the whole philosophy? And the whole philosophy, as Chris Fisher, will, I saw he was on your show recently, mm. the traditional, the orthodox positions are that the physical world is determined and we have no say in it. And this is a real sticking point for, for, for modern Stoicism because modern Stoicism is all about agency and freedom and self-authorship. But classical Stoicism will argue that the entire world is determined. And our only freedom is to accept that mentally. That's why they call compatibilism for Stoicism. And if you subscribe to that, it sounds defeatist, but if you subscribe to that and you're working in a job that you find menial, there's a real humility that you can take from it. And what is the humility? The humility is that I am an effect of a previous cause, which itself is an effect of a previous cause. I'm part of a chain of causes physical causes. I have my role in that chain. Uh, it's what the Stoics from Epictetus to Posidonius to even Heracles will talk about the, the beauty of the universe itself. And of course, Marcus Aurelius is perhaps most eloquent in that regard. This physical determined system of which I am one part. And if I'm working at Tim Hortons and I find my job less than rewarding, or if I'm the prime minister of a country and I find it less than rewarding, both have similarly and equally been determined by prior causes. And so the happiness that a Stoic sage will find from that, which I'm not necessarily saying we all need to be, but if we're interested in Stoicism, we want to take benefits from it. One of the advantages of the, of the Stoic perspective is to recognize that our seemingly apparently or seemingly menial role is far from it. It's an integral part of this chain of roles, chain of causes. And look, that takes a lot of humility. Um, and it's also dangerously subjugating because if people find themselves in the modern era in positions of real adversity, then there is the argument. I'm not making this, but there is the argument that Stoicism argues, uh, encourages them to accept that adversity and accept that subjugation in a way that does not engender social change, in a way that says that everything was always just destined to be this way, suck it up. Um, now that is problematic, but if we're going to adhere to a convention, to a traditional or an orthodox line of causal reasoning, then it potentially could be hard to diverge from that. Now, I'm not necessarily saying we have to be that extreme, but in terms of your question again, you encounter these people who sometimes are in roles that we might not find rewarding personally, but they seem to be filled with great joy and they seem to be filled with great humility when they undertake these roles. And I would say in doing so, there's an aspect of their day-to-day -day behavior, which is incredibly stoic. Um, even if they're not realizing it, even if they're not filtering it through this, uh, this mechanism that I've just mentioned, because perhaps they do recognize that they are one part, maybe they're in a small town and everyone fulfills their role and they get great joy out of that. And they see in a very concrete way, the, uh, the, the joy that they pass on to other people or, or the, let's say the reliability and the consistency, they come in to get their coffee and then they, they move on and the little social fabric just kind of reverberates and it does the same thing day in, day out. And people know uh, what they're going to encounter and that provides them with a certain peace of mind. Uh, maybe this is part of the, part of the, part of the secret to these people's capacity to be happy in and capacity to bring a certain joy to other people when they encounter them too. Right, right. Well, yeah, and it certainly seems to be the case that any less, any less than your best does take away from the world in some way. And you think about someone that, let's say the CEO that's going to get his coffee at the drive-thru who's just miserable. 
And then you look at the person who's giving him his coffee, who's so happy. And you think, you know, you might think the CEO makes what, like a thousand times more money. Right. You think, but then you think about the moral value of what they're doing in the world. And it's like the person that gives coffee to a couple hundred people a day and, and gives a smile and a good kind, good morning or something like that. Like the moral value versus the CEO who's t talking down to people and making people feel small. Not that you can't be a good CEO too. I want to make that clear, but just to kind of, you know, this, this gap in, uh, in let's say our, our, our st social status or what we deem to be social status. Right. But yeah. It, it is, it is interesting that um, people, some people have the simplest jobs and are so happy doing it. And some people have the most, what you would think would be very rewarding. They're taking on a lot of responsibility, but they're, but they're just, they're just so miserable. And, and the moral values of that are are a consequence of I think how much you're willing to fully engage and voluntarily accept whatever that role is. Mm, yeah, I think sociology also has helped me uh, flush out these positions in stoicism because it's also very practically minded at times in terms of when it will study certain populations quantitatively and work out what makes people happy, you know, in, in one of these uh, approximations of happiness in a conventional sense, not the stoic eudaimonic sense of happiness. But um, when I was doing my PhD, one of the thinkers that I studied was a guy called uh, Henry, Ber Henry Bergson in, in English. And he says that it's impossible to measure happiness because it's a qualitatively shifting state. But sociology doesn't agree with that sociology will measure people's happiness and and will try to decipher or determine which populations are more happy than others and which demographics are more happy than others and you'll get these studies sometimes which says you know toronto is the happiest city in the world or something like this yeah, um yeah. but beyond beyond that comparative uh process i think sociology is interested in in a localized way what what do people report as being rewarding? And, and there's an aspect of stoicism which intersects with that around this idea of, you know, you were talking about the, the morals of it and for the Stoics that le leads us to questions around virtue and living a virtuous life. And virtuous doesn't mean being altruistic. It doesn't mean uh, sacrificing the self for the sake of whatever it might be, but Nevertheless, it does mean recognizing how embedded you are, again, I will say this, with, with something greater than the self. And so in a way, everything you do will be motivated by something greater than the self, but it's not altruistic because you're part of it. You're embedded within it. So it can never be selfless. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a, it, if you really wanted to push the selfish kind of uh, argument, we could do a deconstruction of that term and argue that the singularity of everything in Stoicism means that there is this oneness that is selfish, but that's getting into the, uh, hmm. the, the, the perhaps possibly the more abstract part of the philosophy. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm interested to know your thoughts on because you mentioned how they how sociology studies happiness, hmm. and it seems to me that just because, let's say, you have a happy person, a flourishing person. Obviously, that doesn't mean that they don't feel unpleasant things. Mm. And so you might ask, what, like, what is the distinction there? What separates someone that is, let's say, as an example, <coughs> we have a couple that's arguing. And if, they're really, if they really love each other and they want the best for each other, and you take them out of that argument, even if they're really heated, and you ask them, do you still love this person? Do you still want to stay with this person and help them? And you want to get through this? Nor they, they'll, they should say, yes, of course, this is just a, an argument we're having, but we're going to get through it. But then if you take like a toxic relationship and they're arguing, and then you take one of them out and you ask them the same question, they could be homicidal, right? They could really be like, no, I, I'm really at my wits end here with this person. And I just, I, and, and because it's so toxic, and by that, I mean, not only do you not want them to flourish, you want them to have the opposite of a flourishing life and you're actively seeking that out. That's like mm. a toxic relationship in my mind. Right. But I, I don't know, like, is there some kind of distinction there? Do, is, is that thought about at all in sociology? Like, how do we deal with these 
darker or, or let's say unpleasant times in life, even if our life as a whole is, let's say, happy or flourishing? Oof, in That's sociology. Yeah. yeah. Um, I suppose any discussion like this requires distinguishing for the Stoics happiness in a rationalized, virtuous way, eudaimonic happiness versus happiness as feeling good. And sociology, if it's if it's looking at happiness individually then and it's asking people whether they're happy then it's probably con- referring to the conventional the latter definition the idea of do you feel good and less are you behaving rationally less are you behaving virtuously etc as for your in terms of whether if people are in these relationships and they're they're not necessarily virtuously minded regarding how they're interacting with each other. Uh, Sociology would probably be interested in that only from the question of what impels people to treat people poorly that they are nevertheless invested in, in a relationship they share a happiness with. What impels these people to behave this way even though they actually would probably hope for the best for this person because they're their partner, let's say. And once sociology opens those questions, it looks at things collectively. So it's part of the distinction between sociology and psychology. What psychology is trying to track quite often, not exclusively, uh, an individual narrative from youth or pre-youth to adulthood. What happened to you when you were younger, which made you behave like this towards someone you love when you're older? Sociology, whilst it won't ignore those questions, will look at the motivations and the outcomes from people's behaviors in terms of what's going on in a more horizontally present sense. So what is it about a collective mind that impels you to do what you're doing? And that could come down to any number of variables that we don't have time to explore. But it could be as simple as things like if you're in a certain socioeconomic group, then the pressures that you feel from being in in that socioeconomic group will lead you to behave irrationally towards someone you love at a localized sense, perhaps, and this is where the psychology would come in, perhaps to gain a certain control in the domestic sphere that you don't have in the public sphere. Because let's say you are in the lower socioeconomic group and your friends make more money than whatever it might be. And you feel like you're uh, disempowered in in a public way. You can try to gain some of that power back in, in in the private sphere, even though ironically, you might be doing it with someone that you actually care about. And so your actions won't reflect your feel they won't reflect how you feel but rather it would reflect something that was going on or even something that you think but something that was going on that was influencing you and this is probably where stoicism could re-enter the conversation and say and they'd be quite concerned about this and they would say you're behaving irrationally because you're worried about this thing in this case socioeconomics you're worried about how much money you have and that's affecting how you're behaving and and you're behaving irrationally uh, as, a, as a consequence of you being so invested in what they would call an external, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and I, I can definitely understand, I mean, when you're dealing with people that have such issues, uh, I think the environment obviously, very obviously, can have a huge effect on us. And the stoic question is, does it have to, right? Or, or, or do you have agency over, over your life? Can you change your perception on something like, my income level, obviously, assuming you're getting what you need to, you know, you're getting basic food and hopefully a bit of shelter and that kind of stuff. Uh, Because I I do think that stoicism is based on something resembling a functioning psychology, 
And that is, mm, if, yeah. if, if you're yeah. deprived enough, and I think, you know, people like Alexander Solzhenitsyn or Viktor Frankl, I think they push the envelope on what it, what it meant to have a, a functioning psychology under very harsh conditions. But, but yeah, I, I, I certainly do think that for the most part, we, we can kind of change our perspective on those things, even though that pressure can be severe. But, but I do want to ask though, in terms of context, in terms of being present in in different environments. So let's say you have your family life. Let's say you have the work version of you as a, as a professional. Maybe you have a different version. In fact, I would argue that in some sense, you have a different you depending on who you're talking to, even if it's different friends that you yeah, might. Yeah, I love that. Right? I, I, I don't love the effect, but I love <laughs> that you said that. I believe it too. It's, yeah. it's, it's interesting, isn't it? I, I would even say that I think people feel this. So here's an example. You're at a party and you're having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone. And it might not even be, it might be a kind of a heart to heart, but it might not be deeply personal. It might not be something you're embarrassed about, but then someone else kind of comes over and joins in on the discussion. And then there, all of a sudden it's like, there's this, there's this effect that both of you that were engaged in the conversation mm. can feel where it's like, okay, let's maybe back up <laughs> a little bit here. So it's yeah, interesting, yeah, yeah. but I'm just kind of curious how, how you would think about this, because the question is, is that still you? Is that still the genuine <laughs> you? Or is that a facade or, you know, is, is context, can you, can you, I guess, put context in the filter and, and change what side you let out of you? And is that disingenuous or not? Uh, it's, <laughs> look, I do think that we are expressions of our environment. I'm going to show my hand here. And I know that there will be some of your viewers who will be concerned about me saying that in terms of the aforementioned position from Seneca, let's say, where he will say, don't be steered by the masses. Don't be steered by your company even. Remain true to whatever it is about you. And the reason that I think we are inescapably, inherently products of our environment. It's not just from a sociological point of view, but it's from that classical stoic position where we are our environment. We are a fragment of our environment because let's remember in stoicism, the environment is God. The environment, and, and I don't mean this in a transcendental way, of course, everyone yeah. will know the, but the environment is, or the world is, this physical, rational being in Stoicism. And we are that. We are one part, one expression, one fragment, according to Epictetus. Uh, we are one part of that. We are always an expression of it. And depending on how deterministic you want to get, will determine how, pardon the pun, how far you think we can self-author ourselves despite our context, despite our environment. I think every Stoic will agree that, or every person reading Stoic philosophy will agree that one of the beauties of the philosophy is that it says, despite what's going around, going on around you, you can, you can reflect on your perspective, as you said, you use that word perspective. You can reflect on your perspective on it and you can change that perspective. However, what you're asking is when someone comes over at a party and our personality seems to change or the or our feeling around the situation or our perspective seems to change does that mean that we're now a contingent form of ourselves, and we've lost sight of our essential or true self right and i think that our essential or true self according to the stoics is our mind that's really all there is and that mind whilst we do have some control over it it is still a piece of something that is situated beyond us, which gives us one foot in each camp. Our true or essential self is our localized version, our mind in the case of stoic vernacular. But our mind is also something that is shared. And that word is very important, shared with something beyond ourselves. And so this is just my perspective. And you'll give your be given other perspectives from other guests. But my, my perspective is that that sharing of our individual mind and the universal mind means that our true essential self is never, ever 
an isolated, non-contextual, non-environmental feature of our being. It's always, always shared. And <clears throat> yes, in this latest book I've written, I've really, really dug deep into mm-hmm. all of the ancient eras to show that I believe that when the Stoics argue that we have control over our perspective on things, it's a control that is never isolated. It's a control that is never down to us alone, but it's something in which we participate rather than something that we possess. Yeah, and I would actually agree with that because I think I think dichotomy of control, I think that word control often implies complete control. And I actually <laughs> don't think that's what the Stoics really meant by that. I, I think they meant that there's a lot of things that you have... N- I, I think influence is a better word. It's like you have influence yeah. over certain things, but there's some things you mm-hmm. have no, absolutely no influence over. Those things don't even worry about, but there are things that you do actually have influence over and, and maybe you can you should focus on that more so. But it's it's curious too because we're all, we're often in a world now where you hear things like it's almost like you do there is this it's seen as a strength to be vulnerable and show yourself to everyone. Mhm. But it's interesting as well because you're going to be different say with your partner than you are with your child than you are with your boss than you are with your coworker than you are with a friend than you are with who, who's giving your coffee at Tim Hortons. So, and, and I think <laughs> I got to keep bringing in Tim Hortons here. They're not sponsoring this podcast, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but there also is a huge benefit to exclusivity. <clears throat> so there's something about having, let's say, one romantic <clears throat> partner. And you're going to share things with them. Mostly, let's say, your life, your day-to-day mm-hmm. life. That... It's not even that you, you can't, you physically, you, you're unable to share that with the rest of the world, but, but it also creates this, this bond that I don't think you get without that. It's like, if you're going to share that with everyone, then what makes up that individual, that particular connection at the end of the day? Um, this is a great point. So if we think about Heracles' imperative regarding the circles of connection, and he, he impels us to draw in people that we aren't familiar with, right? So it's exactly what you're saying. And Aristotle says the same thing. Uh, this idea that we, well, Heracles says that we should try to be treat people who we're not familiar with as though they were our relatives. And we should treat people who we've never even met as though they're people who live in our same, you know, village or something and bring everyone in a little bit closer. So he says that in one regard. But then in another regard, he says, we should not forsake the intimacy of our most personal relationships and our most close familial relationships. And we should not forsake them for this other project, let's say. And Aristotle says the second thing as well. He says that we should not spread ourselves so thinly that we forget that our most important relationships are these ones that we share in day-to-day for And this is important because it shows that there's this real distinction, a real practical distinction. Let's say, let's just talk about the Stoics in terms of cosmopolitanism, in terms of how far we spread our attention amongst our fellow beings. Because they're not, Stoicism is a practical philosophy and it would be impractical for us to try to treat everyone in the world with the same attention. First of all, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have the time, we wouldn't have the attention, the energy, etc. Right. So the Stoics are very conscious of being practical, and Heracles on this point, whilst he does wax lyrical about in, creating a bigger community of people with whom you're familiar, he also doesn't lose sight of what should be most important day to day, which is fostering these incredibly intense localized relationships. And like you said, you can't share everything with everyone. Um, maybe the, the notion of sharing there is relevant only in the sense of what we have in common rather than what we go out of our way to, to share. Right, right. Yeah, for sure. I, I think too, this, here's an interesting question because then it's like, <clears throat> 
can is it possible to become better at being yourself all the time it, <clears throat> and it's well we all know people i think that seem to be the same no matter who they're with and sometimes these people are a little embarrassing to be around <laughs> if i'm being honest because you know you might i don't know they they're just they're just themselves they're completely right. themselves and it doesn't matter if you're in a crowd of a hundred people or a thousand people they'll they're just going to be blatantly themselves and sometimes that can come off as rude in certain situations because when you have a close relationship with someone a lot of times you can talk about things that might be a bit more say controversial uh than you can if you're let's say having a doing a public speech or something like that so but some people seem to be able to just just blatantly be themselves all the time so then the question is well, is, is that a, is that a good thing? And B, is it possible to get better at that if it is in fact a good thing? Right. I suppose it depends what being yourself means. <laughs> yeah. Being yeah. yourself means running around town and yelling at everyone. What you, I, I don't have pleasant thoughts about everyone, right. um, but I don't think it would be an exhibition of strength. I don't think I'd be a strong stoic if I was being true to myself and wandering around telling people what they think because I also recognize what I think because I also recognize that what I think probably isn't always right. Um, so it, de it would depend what being yourself means. And mm -hmm. I get the sense that, or I get, I get the point that if you're being yourself and you're not lying to other people, that's a strength and that's a virtuous thing that you're not being disingenuous. I suppose it really comes down to again what does being yourself mean um yeah it is interesting it's good to be honest it's, it's it's good to not uh present yourself in a in a different way from who you are um i suppose that would also have to be always combined with a certain humility around <clears throat> around who around who you think you are versus who you think other people are um right if, if 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 these are people if if people aren't being necessarily if they're not running around insulting people and they're just if they're just saying this is what i think and someone else says this they're not scared of giving their opinion and someone else will complimentarily say yeah this is my opinion and they can have a really strong debate without insulting each other and respecting each other's position then that is something that definitely is lacking yeah, in a, particularly in the political spheres today, um, the capacity to interact with someone that you disagree with, and the capacity to not make the argument personal, the the capacity to not be insulted if someone disagrees with you, this is right. this is a strength, a stoic strength that we should probably be introducing at school level. Um, the how do yeah. you debate properly, and how are you how do you do so in a way that exhibits a mutual strength where debate is something again in which you participate and you do it collaboratively um that 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 would be wonderful if people could have and academics are sometimes the worst in terms of having the thinnest skins and mm -hmm. having their theories criticized and taking it personally um whereas these should be arenas and the public area sh uh, there should be the public arena as well of um of discourse and interaction and debate and argumentation, which is all about an exchange of ideas and being willing to learn from it. But even if you're not willing to learn from it, just respecting that you're, you have to expect that other people will have different opinions from yours. It's, mm -hmm. you know, the stoic thing about you're going to encounter people who will not be kind, who will not be virtuous. Um, the figs argument. And yeah. And, and so, yes, that would be wonderful. In what I've come to the point through <laughs> answering a question, I think it would be wonderful if people were just themselves, as long as being themselves meant that they could approach interaction with other people in a in a way that didn't take offense as often. Can I? Okay, can I put some words in your mouth and see if you agree? Because hmm. I sure. think because I think you get you gave me a bit of clarity there as well in how you describe that. As you move closer to becoming the sage it's better that you become more yourself okay 
Yeah, that, that's succinct. That's yeah, better. <laughs> I think that, and it makes sense, I think, because, and again, in the Stoic sense, becoming virtuous, again, and, and maybe we can argue this as a belief, or maybe we can argue it naturalistically, but they thought that that being virtuous was becoming who you actually are. Mm. So it it is interesting that that does align. Because again, if and the example I was kind of using is that person that says things that might not be so appropriate in certain circumstances. So they right. actually wouldn't, they wouldn't be pro-social. They wouldn't certainly have the wisdom to, to recognize certain social cues. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so yeah, I guess that makes sense is that the closer you get to sagehood, the more you can. And then the question is, uh, it's like, like where, how can you even, where do you draw that line? Like, how do you even, I'm not trying to say here. It seems to be a process in and of itself that you can, I guess, as you become, let's say, more sage-like, you can align who you actually are and and be that more to everyone else, which would be, I suppose, the the sage thing. If you think about the sage, like, let's say Socrates is the closest thing we have. It's like, we all pretty well know who he is, good, bad, and and sometimes ugly, right? Like, we have, I, I mean, we can argue about the historical records Sometimes and all that annoying. Stuff. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> annoying, right? Regularly annoying. Right. <laughs> yet still, yet still considered by many it to be a sage. Yeah. So it's interesting, yeah. I, uh, I, I wonder if a personality like Socrates could be tolerated today. Um, I don't know. At what point would he be? And I mean this in every with every respect. Is at what point would someone like Socrates be institutionalized? Yeah, um, yeah. For for being too persistently bothersome in the public sphere, right. um, and Stoicism is such a public philosophy. It was designed to be informally interactive, and there you get that that idea of Socrates being. In one way, it's uh, <clears throat> it's God parent, and uh, Donald Robertson's written quite a bit about that, I believe, and and yes, <clears throat> the idea that we can have these people who will just wander around and bother people with questions about virtue and rationality and and uh, the good life and <clears throat> and so on, I do wonder if people like this would get moved on by police in mm. twenty twenty two. Um, if there wouldn't be a space for them. Yeah, and I'm going to say something maybe really mm. controversial here, but maybe maybe Socrates wasn't a sage if he <clears throat> was at that point because cause you can imagine if you see two people arguing over something and one of them is very, let's say, academic about it <clears throat> and the other one is is more emotional on the emotional side mm. and, the, yeah. and, and the academic, he, he or she, they kind of press the point and they can, right. and the other person's getting emotional, but they keep pressing because they're so focused on being right. I don't think that's the stoic approach. I think the stoic approach is to take the context and and be aware that this is probably isn't doing any good right now. Uh, just getting emotional. This is only going to degrade the the interaction. So kind of having that again, having that connection that you mentioned earlier, that view from above, that that you're a piece in a in a in a puzzle. Yeah, and recognizing that the system isn't perfect and it will have irrational expressions and those ir- ir- irrational expressions come in the form of annoying overbearing aggressive humans sometimes and i i think about this sometimes when i get on the bus mm-hmm. and people can be a bit pushy when they get on the bus sometimes yeah. and the stoic mandate would be to expect that to be the in a modern self-help way it would be always appreciate the people have other things going on in their life which might motivate them to be violent or unpleasant now and be uh, be sympathetic the stoic thing would be the system isn't perfect it's going to express irrationality you're encountering that irrationality again it's the fig tree argument um and what is most important is how you respond to it how yeah. and and that's the control that you have over your mental appreciation of the of the let's say the violent uh in, interaction or the unpleasant event and that's the again the strength 
in stoicism is is that reminder that you are this piece of a whole and that you do have this capaci- capacity to be calm in any storm and and to calm yourself and yeah yeah that's a very very practical imperative and i would say too that it it might still be the case that you're frustrated you might still yeah, feel yeah, upset yeah. i had the situation happen la- a couple of weeks ago actually something happened and i i knew one of my colleagues was going to call me and just annoy the shit out of me if there's something right i knew it was happening and i was preparing for it premeditatio malorum i was ready for it but then when he <laughs> called i was still just frustrated but you know i was right. i was i was controlled but i i just remember thinking like all this work i did and i'm still yeah. just suffering through it but um so but again that's kind of like the, the sage thing as well i think even the sage can kind of get internally frustrated sometimes but again it's kind of like how you react to it and how you deal with it yeah i think you know the modern terminology of that around negative visualization and yeah. preparing yourself for these things i wouldn't say that i am a consistent negative visualizer but at times just when i've been daydreaming i've found that i've done it yeah. and i don't necessarily think that if i encounter some of these uh what would you call them occurrences in the future that me having premeditated about them will <laughs> make me less frustrated or less upset yeah. when they occur. Yeah. Uh, it can't hurt, I guess. Um, but right. you're right. You know, you can still think these through in anticipation, think these things through in anticipation or, or, and be frustrated by them when they happen. But then it's how do you respond to that? And so much of stoicism isn't about a clean slate of, sage like behavior yeah. and instead is about the call and response where the environment environment calls for a certain response what is your response and right. and then you can arguably learn from that depending on your personality and depending on how willing you are to learn from it yeah that's a point i think that often gets overlooked is that i think the stoics knew very well that you're not going to be perfect on the journey no. and you're going to make mistakes no. and you know that's i mean Marcus Aurelius was at the end of his life still making notes in his journal reminding him mm. of how to deal with rude people you know so if that gives you any any solace to uh to your your frustrations and my frustrations um so I guess well listen man I, I pre that was a really great conversation I learned a lot so much more I'd like to dig into but I want to give you a bit of time to talk about your your book which I'm I'm excited to read so oh. what have you been what have you been reading or looking into the book is how do, how could I discuss the book? Um, the book will be coming out early next year, and its main argument is that things that we might think about ourselves that are highly individual, like our mind or our thoughts or our actions, it explores how in stoicism they are traces of a world that we share in together, and so it's looking at this systems theory of our stoic nature, rather than looking at our nature as being entirely independent. And in a practical sense, then it considers how we act as parts of a community locally and in service of a world globally, rather than just act separately or for ourselves alone. So it's not just another book about stoic philosophy in that regard, because recently stoicism has been popularized as a way to really serve personal benefits and promise, let's say, mental resilience to an uncontrollable world of people and events. And that is useful and there is a place for it. But there's also a place for this kind of book, I think, where it explores how for the Stoics, we only benefit personally by being aware of how we are entangled with our fellow humans in the world. And so it's revealing less individualistic conditions for the well-being that modern individuals seek from the philosophy um it's 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 a study of the interconnection of everything and everyone in stoicism and the practical aspect of it is that i believe through this consciousness of this interconnection uh we will engender or we will find a greater sense of prosperity and well-being the kind of prosperity and well-being that people seek from the philosophy to, in the first place than we would otherwise if we just approach it as a an individual kind of journey 
And and I think about it in in another way, in that if I was coming to Stoic philosophy and I was looking for solace or guidance, particularly in a psychological sense or a mental health sense, I don't think I would benefit. And I'm I don't think I would benefit if I was encountering a philosophy which was described as setting up a division between me and the rest of the world and saying, here's what you control about yourself. The rest of it you have no control over. Don't worry about all that stuff. It's going to scare you. It's going to overwhelm you. Push that away. Just worry about what you can control. Now, that's not what Stoicism is about. And I'm not saying every commentary on Stoicism will characterize it that way. But there is a tendency to, I think, alienate ourselves from our surroundings in some some recent perspectives on stoicism i don't i'm my book isn't about criticizing any other works my i, I it's, it's this isn't one of those pieces it's more just contributing another work that should sit aside those in people's libraries which says that rather than viewing yourself as uh this isolated entity over which you have control and you must be defensive set up these borders uh in relation to the world around you, this external world. Uh, instead, the Stoics are very interested in control because of how enmeshed you are with everything and everyone. And I think that's firstly more consistent with ancient Stoic principles, but secondly, a much more um, conducive way to induce good mental health and good psychological benefits from, or, and psychological benefits from the philosophy. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, I'm I'm really looking forward to reading it. And and I would agree. I don't <laughs> think you can get the benefits of stoicism without making that connection. I don't think you can just mm. come into it being completely selfless. Because you're you're missing the spirit of it. The spirit of it is pro social, is cosmopolitan. And I, I would yeah. completely agree. Yeah. I don't think you can separate it and and be, let's say, as beneficial, particularly in the way that the Stoics meant it to be beneficial, which is to make the world a better place in, in a simple phrase. So, well, thank you so much for chatting with me, man. I, I learned a lot. I'm looking no, forward to reading you. your book. And um, yeah, all the all the best for you. I hope your, your book does, does well. Do you have a release date? I think it's February. So February, okay. it's still got a couple of months away. Uh, doing some pre, pre-publication promotion in the next month or two. Um, it'll be out through Pickwick Publications, and uh, yes, yes, it's, I'm looking forward to it. And it will be continuing some themes. I had an academic book published on social theory and Stoic philosophy, which opened these kinds of considerations a couple of years ago through Palgrave, and this is uh, now developing some of those ideas into a much uh, more specifically Stoic sense. Oh, good stuff, man. Good stuff. So thanks again. Until next time. Thanks, Brandon.